So Mackenzie, what are you thinking about today? What am I thinking? I'm wondering how in Shakespearean plays, gender affects your ability to gain power. Not what I was looking for at all. But. Oh, I'm sorry. Shall we lead further into discussion? Yes, we shall. Hello and welcome to the Shakespeare Podcast. My name is Patrick Ott and today I've got special guest Mackenzie Kelshaw here. Hello. And we're going to be talking about Hamlet and Macbeth. Now, Mackenzie, yes. how would you summarize Hamlet and Macbeth? Well, I would definitely say they are both considered Shakespearean tragic dramas, mm -hmm. where both uh, main male characters struggle with gender, ability, and power along with their supporting female characters. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's very interesting. So, going off of that, what is embodiment, first of all? Okay, so basically embodiment is to put into a body, mm. or in this case, an outer visible and an interior in a visibility with some type of relation between the two. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a complex idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's all what we're about on the Shakespeare podcast here. Uh, yeah. Going from that... It is clear that throughout the play of Macbeth, that Lady Macbeth, you know, embodies the use of gender, power, and ability. So, uh, do you think you can elaborate on this more? Oh. Absolutely. So, if you look at Lady Macbeth throughout the entire mm -hmm. play, she is a strong female character, which I, honest to God, she's my favorite character in the entire play. <laughs> oh. Crazy <laughs> enough. <laughs> Even though it's called Macbeth, it's not called Lady Macbeth. They totally should make a play on her. Oh. But, no, um... So for her, mainly, you definitely see as a female, her level of power and her ability to gain power mm. is demonstrated clearly. Um, one thing is you can see that she's disabled, and by disabled, I don't mean in medical terms, like you're, dis you're medically disabled, so you have crutches or you're right. handicapped. Right. This disability is the inability or incapability of doing something. Mm -hmm. So for her, she is infertile. She's incapable of having children which, in a sense, gives her some form of power over Macbeth because she controls the lineage that can happen, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, it does. Okay. So, perfect prime example of this, actually, that I have right here is in Act 1, Scene 5, Lines 45 and 46, Lady Macbeth says, Come to my woman's breast and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. So in her entire um, monologue, she talks about how she wants to, she wants these spirits to unsex her. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't want to be a woman right. because being a woman means you're powerless. You have no control. You have no ability to actually evolve in life. So, and with her not being able to have children, I mean, to her, she thinks, okay, I have boobs. Get rid of them. Mm -hmm. I can't have a child. So what's the point of being a woman? I want right. to be a man, I want power, I'm capable of killing Duncan more than my own husband is. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> She's intense. <laughs> so, to anyone who's watching who doesn't understand, I mean, you made it pretty clear, yeah. but to relate it to modern day terms, it would be like a woman who wants to be a man, like, uh, I don't know any famous examples of this, but the opposite of Caitlyn Jenner, basically. But in this yeah. case, she wants power, not just to feel like a man, right? Right, she, because yeah. in, during Shakespearean times, mm -hmm. it was known that masculinity equated to power, mm -hmm. femininity equated to submission. There was no right. form of dominance, right? which she was not okay with, clearly. Mm -hmm. I mean, she controlled her husband, manipulated him to want to murder Duncan, mm -hmm. And then ultimately, she then regains her femininity by the end, lost her insanity, became, had a form of disability by not being able to cope with her own emotions, mm -hmm. constantly was scrubbing her hands, trying to rid herself of the blood on her hands that she had from creating the murder, and then as a downfall, ended up killing herself. Yeah, yeah it's a pretty big downfall for a person. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's like a roller coaster of emotions right there. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> So anyway, so going from Lady Macbeth to Macbeth, what can you say about Macbeth himself? Well, Macbeth clearly has some form of masculinity. I mean, mm -hmm. during this time period, masculinity equated to um, uh, bestowing some form of anger mm -hmm. and violence, 
which I mean one can say he definitely had when he was on the battlefield but when it came to more civilized discourse he was incapable of doing which is one of his many flaws I think greed is definitely something that comes into play mm -hmm. I mean his greed his hunger for power is one thing that drives him to end up fully following through with killing Duncan mm -hmm. and then ultimately he gets to the point where he loves this power he's willing to kill whoever he has to to ensure that he doesn't lose it right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he ends up losing it in the end spoiler uh, yeah <laughs> so moving on how would you compare Macbeth to Hamlet in terms of these characters and also I guess the broader stories themselves okay so in Hamlet if you look at this mm -hmm. Hamlet is clearly disabled because mentally he is not in the mindset to go and rule a country so to give you a little backstory in Hamlet Hamlet's father mm -hmm. King Hamlet we'll just call him King Henry or something just to you know yeah. or Hamlet 1 and then we have Hamlet 2.0 right so Hamlet 1 is killed by Hamlet, the little one, mm. uncle Claudius. Because Claudius wants to be king and wants to change up the chain of succession mm. and rule um, Denmark. But the problem is, is clearly Hamlet is not in the mindset to do it. And mm. this entire play is ran based upon revenge versus... Macbeth is just ran completely based upon power and greed. Um, I definitely would say Hamlet is not as strong as Macbeth. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, if you even look at the comparison of Lady Macbeth to Ophelia, they're completely, it's like night and day. Thus meaning, Ophelia is day, she is praised for having purity, femininity, gracious, grace, beauty, and mm -hmm. then you look at Lady Macbeth, who saying unsex me release, release this milk from my breast mm. she's dark she's ominous she's evil yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay but what about gertrude and you know how's that come to play well i mean definitely with gertrude if you look throughout the play she kind of seems to be more of a supporting character she doesn't really act as much um but she's definitely in tune with her femininity. For example, actually in, um, what do you call it? Where is it? Act 3, scene 4, lines 91 to 92. She states, In the rank sweet, uh, sweat of an esteemed bed of honeying and making love, mm. Gertrude is hurt, but she makes no attempts to deny her son's charges. She is who has decided to be uh, what she wants to be, and she makes no attempt to show herself as the asexual ideal. And this is as a result of Hamlet being mad that Gertrude remarries and marries Claudius, mm -hmm. despite his sentiments. Right. And I mean, like, in some ways, I like I understand where Hamlet's coming from, but then this is where you say he has a lack of masculinity more than Macbeth, because technically, a man. Yes, he has the anger, but he's also feeling multiple different forms of emotions on top of it. Getting mad at his mother for not coping or crying or remorsing that she just lost her husband. Instead, she goes and remarries this evil, crazy, narcissistic, egotistical jerk named Claudius who just wants to rule the country and send Hamlet off because he thinks he's a bag of looney tunes. I've never heard anyone ever be described as a bag of looney tunes before today. I don't know how else to describe <laughs> it. They just, they think, well, I mean, Hamlet ends up saying he's going to act crazy just because he saw the ghost of his father. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah paranoid much? A little a bit. A little, yeah, 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 not entirely mm. have your full two cents. I mean, of course, you know, everyone just sees horse ghosts. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah, I guess one one could say that, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know. I just, I, I don't know exactly how to say it. It's just, how does one put this? I mean, just if Hamlet and Macbeth, once again, are like night and day. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. Right. If you'd like me to explain, I can. I would. I would love to okay. explain. So Hamlet and Macbeth were both characters that had some power 
and we're both betrayed. Mm. Both these characters were driven to utter madness, but for different reasons. Right. Like Beth, for mm. power to become king, and uh, Hamlet, to also become king, but also avenge mm. his father's death. Right. While both these characters let themselves get the best of them, which over time starts to tear them down and deteriorate. So Hamlet's madness began with his depression due to his father's death, then became outraged once he found out his father was murder murdered by Claudius. Mm. Hamlet then planned to take revenge, which caused him to become fulfilled with anger and hatred resulting in his madness. Mm. Uh, Ophelia describes what Hamlet has done. Um, he took me by the wrist and held me hard, then goes he uh, yeah, then goes he to the length of all his arm. Long he stayed, he so, at last, a little shaking of mine arm. And thrice Huss has thus waving up and down. That's an act two, scene one, lines 77 to 84. I apologize, my middle English is not as good as my modern English. It's okay, no one's middle English. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then if you look at Macbeth, his madness had come from his greed and his predictions that it would bring him power, resulting him to become power hungry. Mm. Uh, Malcolm notices that Macbeth becomes fulfilled with greed. And he says this in Act 4, Scene 3, Line 70 to 73, saying, I grant him my bloody, luxurious, advocarious, false, deceitful, sudden, malicious smacking of every sin that has a name. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting, though, that Malcolm is just like, yeah, let him do it. Let him be greedy. Let it be his downfall, because mm. ultimately he's not going to survive this. Right. So, yeah, any, any other points you would like to make about either one, you know? I mean, I definitely think looking through comparison to Ophelia versus mm. Lady Macbeth, Ophelia is very kept to herself, passive. She is represented by flowers, which shows her innocence, but can be very powerful. Mm. Versus Lady Macbeth, who is very controlling and manipulative, which shows her power over men, which also shows how she's more in tune with masculinity over femininity. Right. And she becomes ruthless and power hungry as well as Macbeth. So in some ways they complement each other. But if you look at it for Ophelia, she hands out flowers at one part in Act 4, Scene 5, and in lines 178 through 183. Mm. She says, there's fennel for you, the col uh, columbines. There's rue for you, and here's some for me. There's a daisy. I would give you some violets, but they withered, withered, all, all when my father died. So she's very in tune with her emotions, and she you clearly uses nature to describe it, saying, when her father died, the violets died. Right. So and so has my love for and care for several other people, and Ophelia shows her power over those by taking. Um, revenge on them with her criticism and her death. Mm. And this happens in Act 4, uh, Scene 7, Lines 168 through 171, when uh, the Queen describes Ophelia's dead body. There is a willow, a slant, a brook. There, with fantastic garlands, did she come of a crow, flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> versus, versus Lady Macbeth, who shows her power over men by manipulating and using temptation. Lady Macbeth mocks uh, Macbeth's manhood mm. in uh, Act 1, Scene 7, fifth lines 56, 55 to 56. Mm. That made you break this enterprise to me when you durst do it, then were you a man? But he's saying that you want power, you mm. want to be king, which means we need to get rid of Duncan. So are you a man when you kill him, or were you a man before you killed him? Are you a man afterwards? Are you a man to begin with? Cool. Yeah, she questions everything. Talk about just blah. <laughs> I think it's the best way to say yeah. it. She just goes blah. But um, I also believe, though, that Lady Macbeth shows her ruthlessness when she takes matters into her own hands because her husband isn't manly enough. Mm. Um, in Act 1, Scene 5, lines 45 to 50, she says, The raven itself is horse that croak the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of dearest cruelty. Wow. Yeah, she is totally willing to strip away any form of femininity 
-hmm. to show that she does not have any disability of gaining power and that masculinity is clearly the top prize and that's what matters. Right. Which I think stems from the fact that you just can't have children, which mm -hmm. is kind of sad. But. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that does it here for the Shakespeare Podcast. I'm Pastor God again, and thank you, Mackenzie, for joining me today. No problem. Uh, I'd love to have you back sometime, talk more Shakespeare, yeah. and possibly get a drink. So, I'll see you guys later. Okay. Bye. Bye.